we'll get started here, everyone. Um, again, welcome to our latest installment of our Rutgers Equine Science Center Fall webinar series. Uh, it is my uh, privilege to introduce Ed Wingren. Ed is a field representative, research associate with the New Jersey Farm Bureau, a 1986 graduate of Delaware Valley College of Science and Agriculture, now Delaware Valley University, with a BS in ornamental horticulture. In October 1998, Ed joined the New Jersey Farm Bureau. His main areas of responsibility are state legislative initiatives, outreach, education, and policy development with Farm Bureau members in the northern counties of the state with an emphasis on direct marketing, ornamental horticulture, land use, sales tax, and equine and other livestock issues. From 2002 to 2004, Ed served as confidential assistant to Charles Burris, the Secretary of Agriculture for the state of New Jersey, where he coordinated the development of industry-specific action plans to improve the economic viability of New Jersey's varied agricultural sectors. Ed is a resident of Trenton, New Jersey, residing in the Mill Hill Historic District, where he remains, or where he maintains an 1860 brick Victorian, a yard, garden, and keeps bees. Uh, and just a little bit of background info about uh, New Jersey Farm Bureau, because that is, um, what Ed is affiliated with. New Jersey Farm Bureau is the grassroots farmer organization in New Jersey with over 12,000 members statewide. It is the largest farmer and landowner organization in the state and is part of the American Farm Bureau Federation. And this evening, Ed is going to be sharing with us a presentation focused on issues facing the New Jersey horse industry to ensure sustainability. And at this time, I'm gonna turn it over to Ed. So uh, thanks for that introduction. Um, so I've been working at Farm Bureau since um, 1998. I did, like she said, uh, Jen said, a couple of years at the Department of Agriculture before returning back here. Uh, in my 20 years uh, working between Farm Bureau and the Department of Agriculture, um, a lot of things have changed in the equine industry in New Jersey uh, in particular. Uh, so we've seen uh, sort of the end of a growth and expansion period and then a sort of recession with, uh, within the equine industry, mostly driven by racing and the, the horse racing industry in New Jersey. As neighboring states um, started doing casino gambling, um, the... Um, they, they increased their purses. Uh, so the breeding industry left to follow the other states with bigger money. Um, New Jersey's making its first concerted effort in a couple of years. Uh, in the last four or five years, they really started putting some money uh, back into it. So we're seeing a change or a stabilization within the racing industry, which then trickles through all of the, uh, the industry. Uh, before we get there, though, um, we'll talk about sort of how New Jersey agriculture and some of the land use policies the state have in place can benefit the equine industry. And we'll start with, uh, you can go to the first slide, Jen. Um, farmland assessment, uh, that's sort of our big one. Um, farmland assessed properties give land in production a reduced uh, tax rate. So you only pay the agricultural value of the land. Uh, so you need a minimum of five acres. It needs to generate $1,000 of income annually. And um, equine being agriculture is part of that. Um, most equine operations, there's quite a few people who just do boarding in the state. And that by itself doesn't qualify for farmland assessment. Farmland assessment's about production. It's about what is the land being used for. So most equine operations qualify for farmland assessment through sale of horses or what they call imputed grazing values or the pasture values. Um, those are set annually by a review board uh, and then those um, values are used by uh, all the applicants every year. Um, most of them um, have a um, 
it's about a hundred and fifty dollars per acre. So to make the thousand dollars in annual income, you would need to have at least seven or eight acres in pasture before uh, your farm would qualify on pasture value alone. Um, so that's where sale of horses, uh, uh, breeding, uh, sale of semen uh, for standard breads uh, or breeding by thoroughbreds um, would be some of the other qualifying things. Uh, if I should have said this at the beginning, if anybody has a question or they, uh, as I go through some of this stuff, uh, just write it up in the chat room and I'll point it out. That'll be the easiest way to do it since I really can't see people raising hands. Um, so uh, the biggest thing about farmland assessment with the reduced assessment on the land and agriculture production, we saw in the early 60s through the 50s, a great selling off of all the land in New Jersey. Once uh, they did the Farmland Assessment Act of 64, put the rules in in 65, the late 60s we saw a sharp decline in the loss of agricultural lands. Prior to uh, the passage of the act, we were losing about 50,000 acres a year. Uh, and that fell into the 20 range and then into the 10 range. Um, we creeped back up into the 80s uh, and in the loss of farmland to about 15,000 acres a year. And then we stabilized that in the late 80s uh, or early 80s with the, you can go to the next slide, Jen. Um, with the passage of the Right to Farm Act and the Farmland Preservation Act. Uh, Farmland Preservation Act, set aside some bond monies to start preserving farmland. Uh, they do preserve farmland, um, or they preserve farmland by uh, purchasing the development easements, and then the farmer retains the, what they call the after values or the agricultural values. Uh, once the state became a second buyer, so normally if you were leaving farming, you would have to sell your land to a developer uh, housing projects, uh, industrial parks, those kinds of things. With farmland preservation, you could actually sell it to the state, deed restrict your property, and then uh, be able to use it for agricultural use. And then that would give you an influx of cash to make improvements or changes to the thing. Uh, with that, preserving the farmland was an act to uh, preserve the farmer, which is called the Right to Farm Act. And that, um, uses in part the farmland assessment, five acres or more in, uh, in meeting the farmland assessment criteria. But to be a commercial farm, you need to generate 2,500 in the annual income. So even though farmland assessment for taxation purposes is 1,000, to be a commercial farm, you need to be generating 2,500. Um, if you have less than five acres, if you're generating 50,000 in income, you could qualify as a commercial farm. The only other standard that's a little different is the standard for um, beekeeping, and that's 10,000 in the annual income, and you can be a commercial beekeeper in the state. What the Right to Farm Act does, it protects approved agricultural management practices uh, for the equine industry. The state did adopt an equine AMP. Um, so if you're doing, in general, if you're doing what's in the equine AMP, you're protected from nuisance uh, complaints from neighbors, uh, nuisance ordinances in the town. Uh, we run into a lot of times, a lot of towns have height restrictions on buildings and an equine farm will wanna go to uh, build a riding arena. And you gotta go up a couple stories just to do that so people can stand up in the building on, or be on the horse in the building. Um, so that would exempt, that would preempt the municipal ordinance. So you would be able to, you don't have to go for a height variance to build an equine or an agricultural structure in a town with a, um, a height variance, so, or a height requirement or limit. So these are some of the activities that get protected. Um, equine, um, not only is it the, the breeding, the care, the boarding, uh, the exercise, uh, training, all of those things are spelled out. Uh, the ability to market 
is part of that. So if you're uh, using uh, like horse shows to market and promote hunter jumpers, if that's your uh, thing, uh, if you're got a mini, uh, a small racetrack and you do race horse training for standard bred or thoroughbred, having all of those facilities on your property are protected activities under the AMP. Um, so, uh, and if you've got a niche kind of business where it doesn't quite fit everything, you can get a site-specific agricultural management practice. And that's where the County Ag Development Board or the State Ag Development Committee will come and um, uh, you'll you petition them to say, hey, this is what I wanna do. It's, it's a little out of the ordinary, but it's not greatly out of the ordinary. And they can issue uh, site-specific uh, permission to do certain activities on your farm related to whether it's the marketing of your product or not. Um, there's a really good Rutgers fact sheet. The link is here. Um, we'll make sure you guys can get the slides of the presentation afterwards. Um, that way you can um, kind of see a little more in detail uh, all the different levels of uh, the nuances to the Right to Farm Act. Any questions on that? So if I may, Ed, yeah. um, what is the difference of right to farm protection between just a commercial farm um, versus a farm that is preserved through SADC? Um, so uh, you can have a preserve farm, but your activities on your farm may not be protected. Um, so right to farm is, um, it's a legal protection for doing the right things on your farm. So whether you're a vegetable farm, a fruit farm, a winery, an equine operation, if you're doing things according to approved management practices, you have a, presum a presumption that you can do those activities. Um, so when a neighbor says, Oh, you know, every Saturday from 12 to 6, they have horse shows, and that's ruining the use of my property. Uh, you're able to, um, the right to farm says, no, you have the right to do those activities. They help you market, promote the agricultural output of your farm. Uh, where it may not protect you is if you said, oh, every Saturday, I just want to hold music concerts in my farm and sell tickets and, and do country music festivals. Well, if it's not tied to the marketing of your farm, no matter what you're growing or producing, you're not gonna get the protection to be able to do those kinds of activities. Uh, so a question come up, it says, I got just under five acres, can I still apply for farmland assessment? Um, Unfortunately, the five acres is in the state constitution and that's not negotiable. You need to have five acres in production to, in order to get um, farmland assessment. And then, um, yeah, so Karen, I, I think I handled your question on the differences. Uh, oh, oh, quite. So the difference is on a preserve farm, um, you, you've purchased farmland with a deed restriction. So that deed restriction will tell you what you can and cannot do on the farm. Um, mostly, if you're doing any type of agriculture, like I said, nursery production, greenhouse production, um, equine operations, wineries, all of them are accepted agricultural uses and you can do that on preserved farmland. The difference is the deed of easement may restrict the amount of, say, impervious coverage a property can have. Uh, in that case, the landowner was paid additional funds to do that further deed restriction. In some cases, it may be where the funds came from. Uh, USDA tends to have, when they give federal dollars to states to do farmland preservation, they tend to have an impervious coverage limit. So if that farm was purchased with those federal funds, you may not be able to build a riding arena, uh, a big indoor one, 
have an outdoor riding arena and then also have, um, say, a training track off the back of the building. Uh, so what we tell everybody when they're buying preserved farmland, read the deed of easement that tells you what you can and cannot do on a piece of property. Uh, and they're really important uh, with um, areas that were set aside and carved out so you could do those activities uh, and then not be hindered by uh, what's in the deed of the easement or what's been preserved. All right, let's jump from right to farm. Next slide. We talked, here's where we talked about farmland preservation. Uh, so as the state's going through um, their farmland preservation program, yeah, it's 30 years, 30 plus years old, um, but it's also new in that as agriculture changes, um, issues um, come up that haven't been there before. One of them I talked about, yeah, you can do greenhouse agriculture, that's agriculture. But to do that, are you impacting the soil of, of the preserved farmland? And that was one of the reasons why it was farmed. Are you moving too much of it? Are you stockpiling it? Are you scraping it away? Uh, greenhouses, like riding facilities, like to be level. They don't like to be on hillsides. Um, so the state's struggling with uh, what's appropriate soil disturbance to do these different types of agriculture. Uh, and ranking, uh, again, because they were a land preservation oriented program, uh, a lot of farms with equine infrastructure were neglected or overlooked because you might have had 25 percent of the farm in hard infrastructure. Like I said, you'll have a riding arena, you'll have a training track, you'll have uh, large barns for breeding operations. And if you're doing it on a smaller parcel of land, uh, 50, 75, 100 acres, and 20, 25 percent of that's in hardscape, the state kind of penalized those operations. They didn't feel they were viable uh, investments for farmland. Um, that's changed a little bit. Uh, a couple years ago, we've dedicated a portion, the voters of New Jersey dedicated a portion of the state's uh, corporate business tax to farmland, historic, and green acres preservation. That now has set up for the first time uh, a continually renewing supply of money for the programs to make purchases. So now the state can say, all right, we don't have to focus so much on just protecting the soils and protecting productive cropland. We can focus on protecting businesses and industries like the equine industry, like the winery industry, and making strategic um, uh, purchases of, of those kinds of farms with that kind of infrastructure. Uh, because you can have, you know, just because it's it's not in hay, grain, and the traditional ag products doesn't mean it's not a good farm worth purchasing, particularly if you have a lot of pasture ground and a lot of uh, uh, good economics running from the, uh, from, from a successful equine business. So, um, and then again, because you do, Equine is a little different than uh, some of the other types of agriculture. Again, horse shows, uh, what are the non-production activities that happen on the property? Um, training of horses is considered production. Showing of horses, uh, really not. Boarding of horses by itself, uh, letting people keep their horse there, let them come and ride. Uh, again, not really considered a production activity. Uh, but uh, an important part of what goes on in the equine industry. All right, next slide. So we kind of got through the basis of um, what, where the framework of New Jersey uh, agriculture is, uh, how we've done tax policy to through right to farm, I mean, through uh, farmland assessment to preserve the land, then an option for 
reducing the cost of land through farmland preservation, when you remove the development rights, you can acquire uh, agricultural land or deed restricted land uh, less expensive than if you had to uh, do it in the open market. So then the other thing is uh, rules sort of in regulations that um, impact how successful the equine industry can be in New Jersey. Uh, like other parts of agriculture, um, dairy, equine, sheep, goats, uh, our animal livestock sections, beef production, um, New Jersey doesn't really have, uh, other than poultry, large confined animal feeding operations, or which are known as CAFOs, uh, confined animal feeding operations. Um, so most of our livestock uh, are pastured part of the year. They may be in barns part of the year, dairy. Um, we have less than 40 in the state now. Uh, cows move in and out of barns. Uh, but as part of your right to farm protection, as part of your, um, or any farming operation, is how do you handle animal waste, which is something that can cause a conflict with your neighbors. So if you have um, manure stockpiled and it gets wet and uh, starts to decompose and the smells start to impact the neighbors using their home on the weekend, flies infestation start to happen. Um, these are things that farms have to do and manage. Uh, and it's one of those uh, things, particularly with uh, barn and boarding operations that may not have a lot of pasturing where you can easily dispose of animal waste. So it's, it's finding ways to do it. The animal waste rules come out of the federal EPA um, in New Jersey with the Department of Environmental Protection. Uh, they're really simple plans that are designed to be self-certified by the farm that you're, you're managing your waste in a way that's not going to pollute the waterways of the state of New Jersey, uh, not going to impact uh, neighbors, create smells or other things. And whether you land apply it by a farmer spreading it on its fields or in the case of uh, hay-based um, uh, bedding things you'll get a lot or straw based you'll get the mushroom farmers from Pennsylvania and the ones that have started in New Jersey collecting that kind of animal manure as a basis for uh, their crops. So all of that management of animal waste is an important part. Um, in order to qualify for farmland protection you need to have a plan but then you also need to be implementing it. So if you're not following other state rules and regulations, you can lose your right to farm protection. Another big thing, I started early in the presentation talking about the state uh, supporting the racing industry. Um, in the 70s, before Atlantic City and as Atlantic City was getting started, racing in New Jersey between Monmouth Park, Freehold, and the Meadowlands was the king of gambling and sports betting in New Jersey. The rest of the Meadowlands complex, the, the Giants Jet Stadium, uh, the, the IZOD Center, which, um, it, yeah, I think that's the concert hall that's there now. They keep changing names. Um, all of that was built off of extra money made by racing. Um, the state leased um, or, or operated the racetracks and all the extra income went to do other projects by the Sports and Exposition Authority. Um, and then as Atlantic City took off and gaming down there uh, became another opportunity for betting, people stopped going to the tracks a little less, uh, not understanding and not building a following within the racing industry. Um, you know, it, it's real easy to go and throw quarters in a slot machine, and now it's not even quarters. You slip a, a preloaded money card into the slot machine, and you just keep pushing the button. Um, that's a lot easier than figure out handicapping and which horse is going to be a better bet. Um, and as Karen's reminding me, we also had Garden State Park and uh, 
Atlantic City itself had its own racetrack. So there were five really operating racetracks in the state. Uh, so as they, they faded, um, uh, the, the industry was sort of self-supporting. Uh, but as the state began to invest more and more in Atlantic City, um, they kind of stopped investing in developing new fans for the Meadowlands. I remember well into the 80s seeing the commercials for, you know, Saturday night at the Big M and uh, on television. And, and they stopped doing that. Uh, and then at the same time, you had other states going, well, why should Atlantic City be getting all of our money? And uh, other states started looking for what they call the syntaxes. And it started with sort of the casino, the Indian casinos in Connecticut and Pennsylvania and Delaware. Uh, Delaware started first with Dover Downs and then Pennsylvania followed with Chester Downs, turning their race venues into adding casino style gaming to their racing venues. And that started to drain the audience from Atlantic City. Um, New Jersey focused so much on trying to figure out what was happening in Atlantic City that they really ignored what was happening in the racing industry in the state. Um, that all changed a couple of years ago. Um, they recognized the loss of racing, the loss of farmland tied to racing has impacts to the rest of agriculture in the state. Uh, and, and so the state has made a commitment for five years to put at least 20 million a year into uh, supporting uh, purses at the racetracks. That in turn induces people to breed here, uh, stand stud here, to uh, encourage uh, uh, a piece of that racing pie to, to come into the, uh, their hands with better racing, with better uh, uh, higher handles, you get better horses, you get better racing, you get better betting. And that really showed up this spring with uh, uh, the COVID shutdown. Atlantic City was shut down. Most of the neighboring states, their casinos were all shut down. And then you had, when they reopened the state, they reopened horse racing first. And uh, you saw increased betting at the tracks, increased uh, handles, uh, and you actually saw people returning to uh, those kind of activities. Um, unfortunately, they didn't quite get the full thing because they reopened to live racing, but not uh, in-person attendance. And I think that was sort of a missed opportunity for the industry early on. Uh, uh, as the casinos stayed closed because they were indoors, uh, I think they could have made the case that uh, an outdoor gathering at the racetrack can be socially distanced. Uh, and that could have been a great opportunity to introduce uh, a new uh, audience to horse racing. Um, why that's important is, uh, not only does that industry bring in revenue to the state of New Jersey, uh, it also brings in uh, supporting infrastructure, uh, veterinarian services, uh, farriers, um, the kind of people who care for, train, and work with uh, those animals can all, um, uh, all benefit from a strong racing industry. And then you, you have um, somebody who may have a, a hunter jumper or a uh, riding uh, training facility, uh, you have got the same vets that come and treat racehorses, come and treat uh, those, those animals. Uh, without a, a critical mass, you start to lose those investments. Um, again, it, it carries through to uh, tech and supply shops, uh, when, when you start losing a segment of the industry, uh, the other areas start to suffer because investments aren't made in them. And that's uh, one of the challenges. Uh, when when uh, a lot of the breeding and uh, opportunities um, moved out of the state, uh, again, following the person and supplement monies, um, 
you, you saw um, some of the people who were training to work as vet techs and, and with veterinarian services, uh, sort of a consolidation of them. Uh, New Jersey's location saved it because uh, why would a vet practice pack up and move to Pennsylvania just because the horses did when, you know, within an hour you can be in Pennsylvania to some of the horse farms and you can uh, manage those things. Um, we also still have, the Meadowlands is still the premier racetrack for uh, standard bred racing um, out in the US. Um, so so you, you still have that kind of infrastructure here, but if the racing industry folds, you can see a collapse of those related things coming down. Uh, we talked about farmland preservation, green acres preservation is a part of that, and that's the pres preservation of open spaces. And then with the battle for open space and parks and from athletic fields to uh, hiking trails and linking stream corridors is where do people ride and get to ride their animals. Uh, it's nice if you have a really big farm with a boarding operation and you can go um, set up trails in, the, in, in your woods and around your fields. Um, but but not everybody has that. You've got a lot of uh, boarding facilities are in sort of urban neighborhoods or suburban neighborhoods uh, where you don't have a lot of places to ride. So as you, they develop parks and park trails, making sure equine activities can use those facilities is, is one of the challenges we have uh, here at Farm Bureau because it's not strictly preserving the land for an agricultural purpose, but it's making sure that all of the recreational purposes can get met when parkland is developed or um, even fish and wildlife properties uh, can provide these kind of locations for trails for horseback riding. Uh, and then within all of that um, are the, the meat and potatoes of all of agriculture in New Jersey, and that's uh, labor and then housing your labor. Uh, agricultural labor, uh, it's expensive to live in New Jersey. How, how and where do you house them in New Jersey uh, is, is one of the big problems. Um, you've got in the rural areas where the farms are, large acre zoning for the most part, and large acre zoning doesn't lend itself to um, group housing for uh, people who need to be on the farm, particularly when you've got a, a breeding operation or even a show operation um, where the horses need more attention and people need to be living on the premise to take care of the animals in case something would happen in the middle of the night. Uh, finding affordable housing close to a farm is one of those issues. Uh, one of the solutions we have is a bill that would allow um, for equine housing uh, when building a riding facility, uh, that if you're building apartments for uh, labor as part of the design and or improvements to an existing facility, uh, equine housing would be protected. It would be allowed and permissible under the law. So this is one of those things where a municipality uh, couldn't say, no, you can't put an apartment and have people living up there uh, just to say no. Uh, they would still have to enforce their building codes that fire extinguishers, fire escapes, uh, all of the human health and safety things would have to be part of the construction, but um, they can't just say, no, you can't house them there. And that's uh, a major shift in policy for New Jersey because it's actually saying, for one, this particular industry, this is critical. And two, it actually opens the door for the greater discussion about uh, how agriculture uh, houses and, and places workers uh, in the state. So I've thrown a lot at you. Uh, anybody have any questions on anything I've covered or thoughts on something I may have missed? Ed, we did have a question um, back a little bit ago um, that was asking about uh, soil disturbance and impact on, on preservation. So to what extent does soil disturbance impact preservation? 
So we're in the middle of learning that. Um, one of the larger greenhouse operations in the state, while the preserved farmland, pretty much flat, but they had to move some soil to uh, do one of their expansions. And they thought they went, got a conservation plan, and um, they thought they followed all the rules and built their greenhouses. And then when the state came through and inspected and looked at the deed of easement, they're like, why is all that dirt piled over there? And what happened to the sloping hillside that was over here? And um, so it was pretty much a 10 plus year court battle. And the Supreme Court kind of chastised the SADC for not having rules and regulations in place for farmers like this to follow. But then they also chastised the farmer for saying, hey, you bought preserved farmland, you shouldn't be covering the whole thing with greenhouses. And you should recognize that soil protection and that should have been part of your plan and you really um, didn't do everything you could have done. So they're in the middle of resolving that and the SADC is in the middle of trying to issue what is the guidance for uh, impervious cover and soil protection on preserved farmland. And this is where we tell everybody, if you're looking to buy preserved farmland, read the deed of easement, because that's what you're buying. You're buying where the restrictions are placed, what they are, and um, these kinds of soil disturbance regs are gonna start getting spelled out in those deeds of easements. Um, if they're not there already, then the state can adopt a guideline that'll say, no more than 25% of a farm can be put into, uh, of a preserved farm can be put into these uses. Now, I'm not saying that's what they're proposing, but that's some of the stuff that people are talking about. We also know, um, you know, it, it'll get into our high tunnel greenhouses uh, considered impervious or are they temporary because you can move them and adjust them uh, what does really the impervious cover mean and what does soil disturbance mean? Uh, because if you, you, I know a lot of the uh, cherry producers that grow cherries in the state, they'll put up high tunnels through the spring rainy season. Uh, because if you're, as your uh, cherries get ripe, if you get a thunderstorm or a heavy rainstorm, you'll get the splitting of the cherry uh, because the roots soak up all the water. So they actually do the high tunnels to push the, uh, the rain and water away from the, the tree so you can have a more uniform fruit. Uh, and that happens with a couple of things. And for equine, it, it would be, um, you know, hey, um, I, I want to expand my breeding operation or I want to expand the number of stalls that will be on the property can I actually build those kinds of buildings? Yes, the deed of easement says buildings for agricultural purposes can be built, but then when all of a sudden you're like, oh, now I'm gonna be doing horse shows every weekend uh, because of the type of operation I have, I'm gonna need uh, maybe a commercial kitchen, maybe uh, uh, to feed people rather than bring food trucks in, I'm gonna kind of, so then it becomes, well, is your catering hall and kitchen necessary for the equine operation, or are you trying to become an entertainment venue? And that's where um, these challenges come in. Great, thank you. We did have another question that came in here, um, kind of going back to the Right to Farm Act, and, and it um, looks like we're asking for a little bit more history on this about you know, who imposed it and why why did they feel that it was needed? What is the, the kind of the history behind um, the establishment of that Right to Farm Act? Sure. Um, so when they created the Farmland Preservation Program, they went to the voters and issued a bond act to start funding it. So Green Acres has been around for over 50 years. 20 years later, they're like, well, we shouldn't just be preserving parkland and we really should be preserving the farmland of the state of New Jersey. Uh, there was a big study done that we need about half a million acres permanently preserved to have a viable ag industry. Uh, we currently have over 250,000 acres permanently preserved uh, and there's over 750,000 acres in agriculture now. Um, 
But when they did that, the people were like, well, I'm not going to preserve my land and then have the township say, I can and can't do certain things. Um, and we did have towns. I mean, towns passed ordinances. You can't have chickens. You can't have cows. You can't have pigs. Well, if you're going to be preserving farmland, you have to preserve and protect the industry of farming. And that's where the Right to Farm Act came in. Um, so uh, not only does the SADC, the State Ag Development Committee, have the responsibility to run a preservation program, they have the responsibility to run the farmer protection program or the Right to Farm program that allows agriculture to continue. Um, so a county ag development board, they create preservation plans, but they also hear the right to farm disputes between whether it's between neighbors, a town, um, or uh, some other uh, interest where the farmer wants to do something and, and they can't get approvals or um, things like that. So they resolve, they're sort of the planning board for farming. Uh, and the interesting thing was we were really good about putting money away and preserving the land, even though for like the first 10 years of the program, it was bond initiative, initiatives every two years. Then uh, Christy Whitman did a big dedication of the sales tax for 30 years, which is going to be wrapping up in another five. Um, yeah, another, another eight years. Yeah, eight years. It's 2020. <laughs> I want to forget this year. Um, it's uh, so uh, she she dedicated a billion dollars in sales tax revenue for the purpose of doing land preservation. Well, that helped the program really grow. And then, like I said, it was three years ago we dedicated the corporate business tax, which will make sure it'll go on in perpetuity. But the Right to Farm Act didn't succeed at first. Uh, the first challenge is, um, despite the farmers thinking, I'm doing an ag management practice, I should be able to uh, set up a farm stand and market my produce. Uh, every time they tried to do it and the town tried to stop them, the towns kept winning in court. And basically the same judge kept getting the case all the time at the superior court level. And he kept saying, but that's not what the law says. That's not what the law says. So in 98, we actually updated the right to farm statute to say, to clarify what are the activities and that you actually have to meet an approved management practice to get right to farm protection. And once you did that, you had right to farm protection. So it's not a, oh, farmers get to do whatever they want. No, you have to do it within these certain guidelines. And once we made those amendments and the next challenges came up, the judge says, yes, he does supersede the municipal ordinance because he's following a plan. He's doing what he's supposed to be doing. And there's all these things in place. So township go pound sand. Um, but those, it, it goes hand in hand. You can't um, have New Jersey's the most densely populated state. Uh, you can't have, um, we also have what we call a home rule state, 565 municip municipalities all writing their own rules and regulations and then saying who can do what and where. The Right to Farm Act is New Jersey's, this is how agriculture will operate within the state of New Jersey. And everybody needs to sort of um, get on board uh, and if not, get out of their way, understand these are the parameters. Um, so when you're buying a house next to a farm and the guy starts his tractor every day at 6 a.m., you know, he has a right to do that. That's his job, him making a living. And sorry if you don't have to be in work till 9 and you don't want to get up till 8.30, you know, the farmer gets to start his tractor at 6 a.m. I, I concur. <laughs> I concur. Thank you so much for answering that question. Um, so we're about to wrap up, but I actually do have one last question that I really, um, that comes from me that I would like to, to ask you. Um, so I grew up in, in rural northern Wisconsin uh, on a dairy farm. 
and my brother uh, is now taking over the farm and he is involved with the Farm Bureau on a local and state level in Wisconsin. And I can honestly tell you that the horse industry has absolutely zero, um, zero agenda items <laughs> in the Farm Bureau back home. Um, it's, not, it, it's, it's just not uh, viewed in the same way as it is here. And so I'm wondering if you would maybe wanna just talk about how the policies in New Jersey and, and the support in New Jersey and the, the attention in New Jersey for the horse industry, how does that fit regionally um, in the Mid-Atlantic and, and how does it maybe compare nationally in a, in a nutshell? So, um, so New Jersey, again, agriculture and land use changes as our dairy industries were disappearing and our poultry industry, actually our poultry industry was the first one to go. Um, <clears throat> what did you do with those poultry farms? Well, you knock down the chicken coops and you put up horse barns. Uh, and a lot of the good poultry ground uh, through Monmouth County, Somerset County, Hunterdon County became horse country. Um, you had uh, successful racetracks and things like that. So you had a big breeding and boarding industry and that is really where the Farm Bureau link came in. Those are production businesses. The hay production on a horse farm to feed those horses uh, were just as important as the hay and silage production of a dairy farm to feed the dairy animals. So for farmers doing those practices, they got involved in their county boards of agriculture. They brought their issues forward. Uh, and that's how, um, as on a grassroots level, those farmers joined the Farm Bureau and said, we have these problems, you need to help us. Uh, now, do we lead on all equine issues? No. Uh, one of the most frustrating things for Farm Bureau is we like to have consensus of our members before we really jump in on a position. And when uh, we're dealing with a little bit of that right now on the federal level with the um, responsible horse race, the uh, gaming, Karen knows the, um, the, the bill that's, uh, uh you're talking about the, the horse, the horse integrity and safety act, the horse integrity and safety act, Mitch, Mitch who McConnell, does, who doesn't love the horse integrity and safety act? Like what, what's not to love? Why wouldn't a legislature legislator love that? Okay. Well, if you're a thoroughbred guy and you wrote the bill, of course you love it because it's going to help your industry. It's going to grow your industry. Um, but one of the things in the bill is it's funded by fees charged every time the animal races. Well, standard bred horses race a lot more than thoroughbred horses race. So for the standard bred industry, the bills, it's like a poison pill. You're killing us. We're going to have to pay these fees to run all these uh, um, problems and or all these issues. So um, we we when New Jersey Farm Bureau was asked, where do you stand on it? We're like, we have a lot of standard bred members and they're not happy with this bill. So <clears throat> we're not saying pass it, but we're also saying don't not pass it because the other good things in the bill are good things in the bill. We're like, you have to fix it. You have to make it fair between the two industries before you adopt it. And so we're working with the standard breads on like, how do we do the amendments on the federal level to make those guys happy? Um, Karen pointed out that also in New Jersey, we had between the Secretary of Agriculture, um, Phil Lampy, who was Secretary of Ag for over 25 years, and his follow-up, Art Brown, uh, both were major big supporters of equine agriculture in New Jersey. They recognized it as um, a stabilizing force, uh, keeping land open, keeping farms productive, uh, and then people like Marjorie Van Ness um, and, and those kind of people who've invested in the industry in the state uh, really worked in uh, um, and and does <clears throat> and did those things. So um, they were part of the Farm Bureau conversation. And so ours grew up organically. Um, again, <clears throat> 
Farm bureaus can be clicky, but anybody who has Farm, farm Bureau insurance or the insurance products, <clears throat> they're Farm Bureau members in those states. They need to communicate those interests and their concerns to the leadership. They need to serve on their county boards. They need to get involved and say, hey, I've got a horse farm. These are our issues. You guys got to help me because, you know, if, if there's a, <clears throat> an insect pest going through the dairy farms, hay fields, they're going through the equine farms, hay fields. They've got like things in common and uh, they need to work together. Um, so it's actually the industry in the state uh, using another outlet and partnering with the farm bureaus to raise their voices. All right. Well, if no one else um, has any questions, I would like to thank uh, Mr. Wingren for this great presentation uh, and for answering our questions about sustainability and New Jersey agriculture and the horse industry. I am going to go ahead and put up here for you um, just a reminder that we are not complete with our fall 2020 equine webinar series for this fall. We do have one more installment in two weeks from tonight on Thursday, October 22nd. Dr. Brian Col Dr. Brian Cahoon uh, will be here uh, to discuss the use of alternative therapy for horses involving acupuncture, which I'm really excited uh, to, to learn about. and. Uh, then we are going to follow that up with our Ask the Experts live event um, on Thursday, November 5th. Uh, it will feature Dr. Malinowski and a host of other uh, faculty uh, and affiliated um, professionals who will answer any and all of your questions. Um, Equine, these events are still able to be registered for. So even if you registered for tonight for, for, um, for Mr. Wengren's presentation and you didn't uh, register for these next couple. You still can go on, same registration link and register. Kyle will pop that in the chat for you. Um, and uh, so make sure you join us. And then uh, looking forward even past that, we will have our evening of science and celebration and we'll have more information uh, coming to you for that shortly. So at this point, I'd like to say thank you to Ed. Thank you. Oh, very thank much. you, Jen and um, Kyle and Karen. Uh, always a pleasure to work with you guys. I. Um, can't brag about you all enough because you make my life easier because you give me facts and figures and science to support our position. That's so. what we do, Ed. Thanks, doll. All right. Have a good night, everyone. Thanks, everyone.